Ezekiel 22, 30. And then from the Brit Kadashah, the New Testament, Mark chapter 10, 35 through 38. Let Adonai, God of the spirits of all human beings, appoint a man to be over the community, to go out and come in ahead of them, to lead them out and bring them in, so that Adonai's community will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Yivkod Yehovah Elohei Haruchot El Kal Basar Ish Al Haeda Ashe Yitze Lefnei Hem Vashe Yabo Lefnei Hem Hashe Vayotzem Vashe Yibem Velo Tihei Adaf Yehovah Katzon Ashe Elachem Roe. Ezekiel twenty two thirty. I sought for a man among them who could build a barricade or stand in the break to oppose me on behalf of the land, so that I would not destroy it. But I found no one. And Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 38, Yaakov and John, the sons of Zavdi, came up to him and said, Rabbi, we would like you to do us a favor. He said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they replied, when you are in your glory, let us sit with you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Yeshua answered, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup that I am drinking, or be immersed with the immersion that I must undergo? Vayikirbu elaya Yaakov vechachanan benezabde vayamru more chafetzim anachnu sheta selanu et asher nishal me miak vayomer elechem ma item ka selakem vayamru alayu techal anu lashpeet echad limniak vechad. Lis molag bikal bodeak, vayomer alechem Yeshua, lo yidatem et asher shaltem, hataklu lishtot et hakos, asher ani shotem uhidatel, hat bila asher ani nidbal. So blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and everlasting life in our midst, and blessed are thou, O Yehovah, the giver of the Torah. Amen. You may be seated. I know it's hot because I was uh, working on my sermon in, uh, on Thursday, and Sister Norma came up to see me, and, you know, if you know Sister Norma and Sister Doris, um, even in springtime, they like to have a little heat. And uh, <clears throat> she came up and talked to me and said a couple things. And then on her way out, she said, it's really hot up here. And I was like, from your mouth to God's ear, sister, I hope, my, hope God hears me and sends a breeze. Um, we have air conditioner up there, but I guess because it's so hot that it was just getting so hot. So I'm hoping that my um, PowerPoint is okay because actually as I was doing my PowerPoint study, I actually was getting nauseated and actually a little bit, you know, I said, okay, I'm done. <clears throat> so it could be a five-minute sermon. I do not know. It could be a three-hour sermon. I have no idea. I just know that this week it was very hot in my office upstairs. And uh, so uh, be praying that the air conditioner continues to chug-a-lug-a, chug -a, chug -a, chug a up there because if it ever stopped, I would, well, that might be a good thing. I would be skinnier, definitely, but... When we look at this Torah portion, we're in leadership lesson number 35. We've been going through the Torah portions, and we've been pulling out <clears throat> Torah portions and, and narratives that have to do a little bit about leadership because we all sit here, and I've said it over and over again for these last 35 weeks, you are leaders. In some capacity, you are a leader. In some capacity, someone looks up to you, whether it's a child, whether it's a, a, a sibling, whether it's a, a, a co-worker. Someone is looking at you. And if you have confessed and professed Yeshua as your Savior around people who don't know him, you are a leader. And I pray that we are the best leader. You know, God has told us in Peter <clears throat> that we are a chosen generation and a royal priesthood. And we went through that when we went through the book of 1 Peter, and we understood what it meant to be a chosen generation and a royal priesthood. But if I would just to wrap it up and sum it up, it would say this, that God is expecting us to be a great example of who he is in the midst of a world who does not know him. And if for any other reason you say, well, I'm not responsible for bringing them to know Yehovah. It, it really, you know, we know that it's God's responsibility to bring them to know him, but at least we could represent who he is. Even if they never accept him, <clears throat> to represent who he is, is the calling that God has given to us. That at least when they stood before God, they would at least say, well, I knew someone that at least represented you. Even though I rejected you, I knew someone that represented you. 
This Torah portion contains what I would consider a kind of a mini essay on leadership as Moses confronts his mortality and also asks Jehovah to appoint a successor. The older we get, the more we deal with our mortality, correct? It doesn't say a man shall live forever. It says it's appointed unto man once to, once to die. I just happen to choose to die at 120. But the thing is, as we get older, we understand the body changes, the strength changes, things change. We can't see as clearly. <clears throat> we're, not, we're not quite uh, being able to pull those words out that we used to be able to pull out. How many has ever just looked at a glass of water? Not necessarily a glass of water, but said, what is that? Give me that. That right there. <laughs> the thing that has that in there. <laughs> and your brain's searching. What is it? 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 Don't get nervous. I know what a water is. I'm just trying to give you an example. <clears throat> we see that our mortality is coming. And so Moses understood that his mortality was coming and that he needed a successor because we know that he already knew that God said, you're not going to the promised land. Someone else is going to take them in. And when we look at the lives of the patriarchs, we see that Abraham entrusted his servant to find a wife for Isaac because he wanted the family of covenant to continue. And he was afraid that maybe Isaac wasn't going to find a wife. So he sends his servant to find a wife because what happens when you have a husband and wife? You have children and then the covenant will continue. A successor. <clears throat> the God of Abraham. The God of Isaac. The God of Jacob. David chooses Solomon. There has to be a successor. The kingdom of David will not stop. It will go on and go on and go on. And we know that the lineage of Yeshua is in this. We find that Elijah, by God's prompting, also appointed a, a successor. And that was Elijah as he went through that, uh, <clears throat> that, that field and he took his mantle and he threw it on him and then went on. But in Moses' case, when we look at his life, especially in Numbers 25, in Moses' case, there's a certain kind of sadness at his realization that neither of his sons would succeed him. We know that it's a must if you're a priest that a son would succeed you. But as a prophet, as a leader, there's no guarantee that a son would succeed you. So here's Moses. He's praying. It would probably would be great if he said, my eldest will take over for me. But he didn't. He just said, Lord, <clears throat> I know that my sons are not going to be a successor. So let me pray. Let me ask you for a successor. So what we do in Numbers chapter 27, verses 16 and 17, we actually hear Moses request from Jehovah a successor. And we see within the language something very powerful. Maybe not in the English language, but when we take it apart and we look at it in the Hebrew language, what we find is that there are three basic leadership <clears throat> lessons to be learned from the choice of his words in Numbers 27. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to move through these three quite rapidly, so don't get excited that I only have three because I'm doing a double duty today. We have three, and we have three of something else. So when we look at this in Numbers chapter <clears throat> 27, 16, and 17, to our natural eye, to our reading experience, we say, let Adonai, God of the spirits of all human beings, appoint a man to be over the community, to go out and come in ahead of them, to lead them out and to bring them in, so that Adonai's community will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Just a sidebar. We know that God's people need a what? A shepherd. We know there's something powerful about a community and a corporate, and we need a shepherd. So here is Moses who is <clears throat> crying out to God, praying to God that a successor would come. So he says, Adonai, and he describes God as the Lord God of the spirits of all flesh. He could have just said, hey, dear God. He could have said, Yehovah. But he uses this description, the Lord God of the spirits of all flesh. This means that he is proclaiming him to be the master of the universe, and he's understanding that the character of each person is revealed to him. Do you know that God knows you even though I don't? I know you on a surface level. Some of you I know on a, on a deeper level, <clears throat> but I don't live with you. I don't walk with you. I, I, I don't go eat with you. I don't spend a lot of time with you. I see you on a, on a basis that, that according to whether you're here or not, I see you there. But I'm not someone. Your wife knows you. Your husband knows you. And sometimes we're afraid that the husband and wife will share with me what they know about you. Which is why we don't want any counseling. Don't go to pastor. You better not say anything to pastor. I don't know what goes on, so, but I do know someone who knows. And that is Jehovah. 
So here is <clears throat> Moses who is asking God you and, and telling God and sharing with God, God, you are the you are the, the God and the master of the universe. The, the character of each person is revealed to you. And he realizes that no two are alike. You might be similar, but you're not alike. Look at someone and say, you are the only one. Now, don't do it with a roll eye. Don't do it with, oh, believe me, you're the only one. <clears throat> you are unique. You are different. You might have similarities of people, characteristics that are similar. You might look, even siblings. Siblings can look alike, but they are totally different in thinking and action and what's going on in their lives. And so he's crying out to God, God, <clears throat> I need someone that's going to succeed me, and I need someone that's going to be able to do what you want them to do, and you know who these people are, and you know that there are no two that are alike, so I need you to appoint them a leader who will be able to tolerate. Say that word with me. Each person according to his individual character. Now you know why you need to pray for me. Because I cannot imagine Moses leading a million people who are not alike, whose characters are different, and <clears throat> we can say our characters. The ins and outs of how they think and what's going on. So we look at this part of this verse, this first part that, that acknowledges that he's the God of the spirits of all human beings. And we realize that he, what he's saying is, God, you know that everyone is different and therefore you understand what it is to be able to cooperate and to have cooperation is essential. In this place, unity is essential. Because we are different and others are strong where people are weak and some are weak where others are strong, correct? <clears throat> we will see that on, on uh, men's work day. Who is weak and who is strong? Strong points and weak points. I don't mind telling you where I'm weak. I like people who are stronger than me to step up and do it. If you said, I need someone to climb that tree. I am weak. <laughs> I need someone strong. Because I do not like that height. Right? So where someone is weak, someone can be strong. And so that's the power of being different. But the thing is, <clears throat> we all respond differently to challenges, which is why leadership is necessary, but it's also demanding because we have to keep these characters and these differences and this diversity, which is good. I am glad that you are diverse. I am glad that we are all different. It doesn't make sense if we just want everyone to be like us. It's good to have diversity, but good leaders respect differences, but they learn how to integrate them in suing harmony because diversity is good, and Moses understood that diversity was good, and what he said was, God, you know all these people. You know all the crazies of these people, and you needed someone that can handle all the crazies of these people to bring them to the promised land. Well, he then moves from saying, you know everyone, so I need someone who's going to be able to handle the crazies. And he says, the second part, appoint, go to the next verse or next slide, appoint a man to be over the community. Now, women, don't get <laughs> your feathers all ruffled. That word, ish, a man <clears throat> who is placed over the congregation, we find that when he asked that, Yehovah in uh, 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 Numbers chapter 27, 18, responds by saying, take for yourself Yehoshua, or Joshua, <coughs> a man of spirit. Ish, a ish of spirit. So ish here indicates something other than gender, because we know that women can be powerful leaders. Do I have an amen from a woman? Do I have an amen from a man? We have Esther, a powerful queen. We have Sarah, a powerful woman, right? <clears throat> Rachel, all those people, Mary, powerful people, powerful women. So when we look at this, he's not saying, listen, a man is the only one that can, can lead these people. What he's saying is appoint a man, an ish. And in this situation, we find it in two places in the Torah that uses the phrase ha'ish, the man Moses. We find it in Exodus chapter 11, and we also find it in <clears throat> Numbers, I believe, chapter 12 and 3. Go ahead and give me the next slide. And what it says is, Adonai said to Moses, take Yehoshua, the son of Nun, a man, and lay your hand on him. Next slide. Adonai made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people. Moreover, 
Moshe was regarded by Pharaoh's servants and the people as a what? Very great man in the land of Egypt. Numbers 12, 3 says, Now this man Moses was very humble, more so than anyone on the earth. We find in Exodus, he's considered a, a gadol mi'od, a very great man. In Numbers 12, 3, he's considered a navav mi'od, a very humble man. What we find here when Moses is asking God to appoint a ish, he's asking God to appoint someone who is humble and yet someone who can carry themselves in a very powerful way. An ish in the context of leadership, is not a male, but rather someone who is a minch. Not a minch on a bench, like in Hanukkah, <clears throat> but a minch. A minch we consider as a wise person, but actually a minch is someone whose greatness is lightly worn and who cares about the people that others mostly ignore. Someone who is humble, but yet someone also who is mighty. Two opposites that seem not to be able to be working together, but actually working together. Moses says, I, I need someone who is able to <clears throat> bring harmony to a, a group of people who are of different character, of different thinking processes, of great diversity. I need someone, God, and you know what I need. I need someone who at one place is very strong and very great, who can handle what is ahead of them, but also very humble, who realizes who is their king and that he's not or she's not the head that Yehovah is. Then the third one, that third clause. In Numbers 27, verses 16 through 17, it says, And I need someone that will be able to go out and come in ahead of them to lead them out and bring them in <clears throat> so that Adonai's community would not be like sheep without a shepherd. To go out before them, to come in before them, who will lead them out and bring them in. You know, as someone who has taken people on tours to Israel, one of the hardest things to do is to keep that group together. And as a tour leader, <clears throat> you have to lead from the front, not the back. You don't say, go ahead of you, and then you're screaming, oh, up there, now go left. You are leading. You, when you go left, they all go left. When you go right, they all go right. When you stop and begin to share something, they all stop, and they look where you're going. And they're listening to what you're saying. <clears throat> so a true leader is someone who leads from the front, not the back. But a true leader is someone who not only leads from the front, but has enough sense and timing to always look back to make sure that someone is following him. What good is it to be so gung-ho in leading that you left everyone behind? It's called timing. It's called pace. And it's very hard sometimes, even in our own lives as husbands, as wives, as parents, because we are leading in front. We are, we are teaching our children what to do and where to go. But at the same time, we must not go so far ahead that when we turn around, they're never following us. It's timing and it's pace. <clears throat> what is Moses asking? I'm asking for someone who is able to handle diversity. I'm asking for someone who is humble but yet great. And I'm asking for someone who can lead in the front but yet not lead so fast that he loses the people. As leaders, we have to lead from the front, but we must not go far ahead that when we turn around, no one is following us. So as we understand <clears throat> these three basic leadership Principles that Moses is asking God. Last week we learned about integrity. We, we talked about integrity being one of the greatest essentials for leadership. You all remember that sermon? If you don't, we have a DVD. We understood that integrity and in leadership is very important. And we understood <clears throat> that, that we had to shore up ourselves and look in areas of our lives that maybe... We didn't have integrity and bring that into our lives so that we would be the greatest example to those that are around us, especially our children, especially those who God has placed in our lives. But as we look at Moses and he's asking for these three basic leadership principles in someone's life, we also have to realize that there is a price of leadership. 
When Moses is asking God for this type of man or woman to lead the people, he was wanting them to understand. And he was asking God, this man, this woman <clears throat> needed to be someone who understood the price of leadership. I think sometimes we don't understand the price of leadership. I don't think we understand the, the power of being a husband or the power of being a wife or the power of being a father or the power of being a mother. I don't think we understand the price of it. We're just used to saying, oh, let me get married and let me have children. But there is a there's a position that you take that is powerful and you need to understand there's a price that is that you're going to pay for those things. I stand before you as a leader. I stand before you as a shepherd. I stand before you who understands the price of leadership. True leadership always demands a high price of the leader. And the more effective, the higher the price. You know, Yeshua said in Mark chapter 10, verse 35 through 38, <clears throat> we, we read it, that uh, James or uh, Yaakov, John and the sons, came to him and said, Rabbi, we would like you to do us a favor. He said to them, well, what do you want me to do for you? <clears throat> they replied, when you are in your glory, let us sit with you, one on the right and one on the left. Now you have to understand something. That the reason why Yeshua is going to sit on the right hand of the Father is because what? He paid a price. If he would have failed, if he would have <clears throat> decided to live his life the way he wanted to live, we, we read about it, if not my will but your be done. He had a personal sacrifice to his life. He understood that there was going to be a sacrifice. And what he's saying to the sons is, are you willing to drink what I am going to drink? And are you willing to be immersed in that which I am going to be immersed in? Do you not understand the power and, and also the, the sacrifice that is going to be required of you to sit on the left and the right of me? I don't think we take it to heart. In speaking about his own cost of leadership, Yeshua declares in Mark chapter 10, <clears throat> 44 and 45, and whoever wants to be first among you must become everyone. Say it. Did you all read it? I only heard three say it. And whoever wants to be first among you must become everyone's. Must become everyone's. Must become everyone's. You know what a slave is in history? Someone who doesn't have a right to do what they want. They have to obey the master. And do you know that what Yeshua is saying, that if you want to <clears throat> be first among, you must be a slave? Hey, John and Yaakov, you want to sit on my left and right, but you don't understand the price that's going to be paid for that? And sometimes we want to climb higher. and Sometimes we want to move into positions that we're not really understanding the power of it and the cost of it in our own lives. That when you accept Yeshua as your Savior, that means that you have been bought with a price. You no longer own yourself. That means he owns you. And that because then he put you in a community that you are yielding to one another. <clears throat> that when you get married, you're yielding to one another. When you have children... For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And what's the next part? And to give his life as a ransom for many. We, if you've been here on Wednesday, we read that last week in 1 John chapter 3, 16, that the, the principle of love is that Yeshua laid down his life. And then the next part of that, verse 16, says, we ought to also lay down our lives for who? For brothers and sisters. See, so I'll lay down my life for you, Yeshua. <clears throat> yep. But if you can't lay down your life for one another, you will never lay your life down for him. If you can't love one another, you can't love him. If you can't be a slave to one another, you will never be a slave to him. So if you want to be a leader and you want to impact your generation, you have to pre be prepared to accept and face the cost of, that comes with leadership. So I have, out of the 545 different costs of leadership, chosen three that I think are the most important that I think we fail to realize and that we fail to apply to our lives. 
The first cost of leadership is personal sacrifice. We live in a day and age where we are trying to save us. We're, we're trying to <clears throat> gain things for us. We're trying to make life better. And I'm not saying that life can't be better, but we have to understand that in biblical context, if you're going to be a true leader, there has to be a personal sacrifice. When you get married, there's a personal sacrifice. When you have children, there's personal sacrifices. When you have grandchildren, there are personal sacrifices that you adore. When you step up to the plate, <clears throat> I'm here, you're there, wherever you are, you're leading something. You have to understand there's a personal sacrifice. Leadership demands a commitment, a service to others, a placing of the needs of others above our own. We struggle with it. Any leader that is preoccupied with the elevation of their own status, if they're preoccupied with their own glory and preoccupied with their own objectives, they're not true leadership. If you're just in the position so that people can say, wow, you're in the position. If you're in the position so that you can have a greater status of position, people can look at you and maybe call that title out, doctor, pastor, apostle, prophet. If the only reason why you want them is so that you can be a little bit higher above everyone else, then you're not truly a leader. If the only reason why you're having a child so you can finally be called a mom or a dad, you missed the point. If you got married just to be called married. Because you're tired of being called single. You miss the point. <clears throat> you're moving into a place where you no longer exist. You're moving into a place where personal sacrifice is given to you on a daily basis. A true leader, <clears throat> a true leader is willing to lay down their lives for objectives that are greater than their own personal well being for the sake or for the cause. I will yield my life. Paul expressed it this way in Galatians chapter 6, 17. <clears throat> he said, from now on, let no one make trouble for me. <laughs> I can just see Paul. Okay. I have a, an epiphany. From now on, quit making trouble for me. Why? For I bear on my body the scars of Yeshua. What he's saying is, can you not work with us? Can you not understand that we, <clears throat> we are fighting a fight that our personal sacrifice is completely and totally, we, we are slaves to the kingdom of God and we appreciate that, that we have surrendered our whole entire being. So at least if we are all people of leadership and sacrifice, let's not make trouble for each other. Yeshua established the price of self-sacrifice and leadership in Matthew chapter 10, 39, when he says, he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. We're so busy trying to find our lives today, but we're not trying to find our lives for his sake. We're trying to find our lives for our sake, and we're still going to end up losing it. <clears throat> True leaders have not only found a purpose and objective to live for, but they have found a vision to die for. Are you willing to die for this word? Would you be willing to die for Yeshua? Would you be willing to give your life up? And I, I want to challenge you that and that and this understanding, because if you're not willing to give up of your personal substance, if you're not willing to be a slave on a daily basis, there is no way you're dying for Yeshua. You cannot bypass all the sacrifices of your life and then end up giving your life for him. We live in a culture today, <clears throat> unlike our parents' culture, because our grandparents knew what it was to sacrifice. I'm just telling you. They would not eat so that they, someone else could eat. They would struggle in a field so that they could have a little bit of food. <clears throat> they would do things. They understood sacrifice. They would sacrifice themselves and, their, and, and, and even sometimes the, the, the happiness that they had for the sake of of family for the sake of children, and we're out of there. 
as soon as we're a little bit moved, as soon as we're a little bit infringed on, as soon as our rights have, have been violated, and we're done. We're, we're out of there because we, we have a right, but you don't have a right. Because if you're a true leader, someone who's been chosen, someone who's been called, then you do not exist anymore. And personal sacrifice is that in your life. You can't come and go as you want, when you want. I'm not trying to be a downer. I'm just trying to get you to see <clears throat> that you need to have something in your life that you're willing to die for. We will never change life in our generation until we are willing to die for that change. How many need a change in your life? I'm not asking you to tell me what it is, but some changes in your life. We all have things that we need to change in our life. <clears throat> you know how I know that you don't really care whether you need to change or not because you're not willing to die for that change. You'll still do the same things that you've been doing. But if you really wanted to change, then you would be willing to do whatever it needed to be done to change it. That could mean even death. Right? But we come to a level. Well, I need to change, I need to change, I need to change. And then we're, we're faced with personal sacrifice. And what do we do? We pull back. Because I want to change as long as I can still be who I am. I want to change as long as I can still do what I want to do. Because it's not worth it. Greatness in life is found in the willingness to die. I am crucified with Christ. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Where does that leave you? Dead. And dead people don't mind having personal sacrifice. Only alive people fight personal sacrifice. But one of the greatest things about leadership is that you have to understand personal sacrifice. Pastor, let's do this. Pastor, let's do that. Let's do this. Oh, I think we should do this. Pastor, I have a good idea. You all have good ideas. We all have good ideas. We all have things we want to do. But are you willing to do the personal sacrifice with it? How many programs have started and then stopped? How many, how many good ideas have begun and then, and then no con don't continue? <clears throat> well, Pastor, you need to push it more. Pastor, you need to push it more. Pastor, you need to push it more. How can I push people that are not willing to do a personal sacrifice? Number two, if you're going to be a leader, you're not only going to have personal sacrifice, you're also going to experience rejection. We don't like that. I want everyone to love me. And I don't understand why people don't love me. Because when I look in the mirror, I'm very lovable. Rejection. You must be willing to be rejected and misunderstood by all. I've been preaching now for going on almost 40 years. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Do you know how many times I've been rejected? Do you know how many times I've been misunderstood? 40 years worth. You can sneeze and be misunderstood. The way you walk, you're misunderstood. What you say, you're misunderstood. You can be rejected at the <clears throat> drop of a hat. John 1, verse 11 says, He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Which is one of the greatest challenges for ourselves because your family won't receive you. And I think maybe just because they know you. And they know your past and they know some things about you and they can't get over that. You are who you are. I can go talk to my siblings and they'll look at me and say, you're, you're just my brother. And I can go to the three oldest ones and they'll look at me and say, you're just our younger brother. We don't know whether they can take us serious or not, so there's a, there's a slight rejection there. When you're trying to do the will of God, but true leaders affect change, and change by its very nature engenders conflict and resistance. That's why the word of God says in the last days, what do people want? They want their ears to be tickled because they don't want to be challenged. They don't want to be confronted. They don't want to be <clears throat> confronted with truth and no one wants to change. And so because the man of God is afraid to be rejected, he then speaks to them in the way they want to hear. Because just to affect change engenders conflict and resistance. I can give you an example. Go home to your children. 
take their phones away for one week. Just say, I'm going to take your phone away for one week. I just think this is what we should do as a family. I am a leader. Pastor has told us about personal sacrifice. I want you to experience it because I believe you're going to be a leader. So I want you to experience personal sacrifice. And I want you to see whether rejection comes. Conflict. I've been there. Listen, I had a <clears throat> an older son that's in, so I can't tell him your name, his name, you, so you don't know him. But I had an older son, and he wanted something one time when he was a teenager, and you know he didn't talk to us for for weeks. Good morning, nothing. You're hungry, nothing. At first, it hurt us. Then after a while, it's like, this is pretty good. <laughs> Other than seeing the face of him, because the face went along with his rejection. If I couldn't see his face, it just would have been like, perfect. Don't go home and say anything. And, you know, sometimes, though, it got to us. You know, that rejection got to us because you're dad, your mom, and you're like, now come talk to me. Because after a while, it starts wearing on your nerves. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes rejection wears on your nerves because you know it's going to be conflict. So <clears throat> you go home and you take your, your, your phones away from your children for one week. And on your way out, I'll take yours. For one week. And then all of you will go out this door. All of you will go out that door. And I guarantee you <clears throat> that at first you might say, sure, Pastor, let's do it. But it will cause conflict and resistance. You won't like it very much. Then you start saying, he's a dictator. He's trying to rule us. Been there, done that, heard that. I have no idea what that means. Because you all don't do anything you don't want to do. I've been here 30-some years. Ain't none of you doing anything you don't want to do. <laughs> Stand up. Try and make some truth. So it goes a different way. You shouldn't have said it so hard. You shouldn't have done it so soft. Well, how should I have done it? Do it one way is too hard. Do it another way is too soft. Should have spoke up. Should have been quiet. I don't know what to do. So just reject me. Rejection does not mean you are wrong. You understand that? Rejection does not mean you're wrong, but it does indicate that you are challenging others to change. And that's what people don't like. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, look, it says, How blessed are those who are persecuted. Someone shout amen. amen. How many want to be blessed by God? Amen. Well, then guess what? <clears throat> be persecuted. What a blessing. I haven't heard any testimony. I want to give the Lord praise. I was persecuted all week long. Hallelujah. And everyone stand up. Glory to God. You go, brother. You go, sister. How blessed are those who are persecuted. Why? Because they what? Pursue righteousness. Listen, you can be persecuted by people just because of your character. Because of your attitude. Because of your shortcomings. <clears throat> Please don't wear that as a crown. I've been persecuted all week long. Why? Because I'm mean. And I don't know why people persecute me when I'm mean. I should be able to say what I want to say when I want to say it. Because I have an attitude and they thought I had an attitude. And then they start persecuting me. Well, okay. Well, you're not getting a crown to throw back at Yeshua's feet. You, all, you, knew that. you do know that, right? It's because you pursue righteousness. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You'll be rejected. You'll step out. Someone will not step out with you, you'll say something, and they'll roll their eyes, and they'll reject you. <clears throat> you'll try to lead them in the way that you want them to go. You'll try to be uh, understanding diversity, to work with everyone, and guess what? You'll give of yourself and sacrifice, and yet still, number two, part of leadership is rejection. How many want to sign up for leadership? It's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. Number three and the last one. Because I don't think you could take any more than three. I already lost you in number one. <laughs> I, 
I'll take a back seat. I'll just be a follower. <laughs> just tell me what to do. Bye. Bye. Tell me where to stand, where to go, what to pick up. I don't want to be a leader. Criticism. You know, criticism is a reality. You know, when you take a position on issues, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be criticized. When you make decisions, you're going to be criticized. When you determine a direction, I'm going in this direction. Guess what? You have a whole slew of people that are going to criticize you. Even the GPS gives you a couple options. <laughs> it's just quite annoying sometimes. Well, the third GPS, the two on the phone and the one that's riding beside you. <laughs> it's three GPSs. Well, I don't know why you listen to them. I've been this way all my life. We got picked up one time at uh, <coughs> D.C. And she's not here, but she wouldn't mind me saying. Lisa, you all remember Lisa? She was with us. She picked us up. We wanted to go a certain way. She said, I've been around here all my life. I'm going to take you a shortcut. When someone says, I'm going to take you a shortcut, grab them, throw them in a trunk. <laughs> Don't let them take you. A three-hour trip now has gone to five. We went back every road. I have no idea what we went back. Uh, you know, you're coming off a mission trip. You're annoyed. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> you're trying to be spiritual because you came off a mission trip. So you're like, hallelujah, amen, God is good. I'm so thankful. Oh, I've seen people and what they have to endure. But now you're in the United States. And you don't have to endure this. And when you say, where are you going? Oh, don't worry about it. It's a shortcut. And then you have like 10 people in the team going, let's kill Lisa. So sometimes you determine a direction, and everyone has a thought about it. <clears throat> you make a stand on issues, and everyone has a thought about it. You take a position, everyone has a thought about it. You know, some issues and some directions are just your directions and your issues. You know what? You know that to be true, right? There's some things that I don't want for my life that maybe you will have for your life, and I can't explain to you, maybe even <clears throat> in the Word of God or what, but I don't want it. And when you take positions on issues, when you make decisions, when you determine a direction, you will always result in some form of reaction from one's environment, and it's usually negative. Usually. So true leaders are not affected by criticism, and we see it as a positive opportunity. Someone say that. A positive opportunity. Blessed are you who are persecuted. But look, it's a positive opportunity to test what? Your conviction and your commitment. Do you know that you know? Are you willing to stand? Is that really a true conviction? Is that really a true commitment? Because criticism can make you get rid of it. If you believe the word of God to be the word of God and you believe it to be all truth, <clears throat> and then it starts, people start coming and criticizing you because it's not a way that they live and they don't understand the way that you live, are you able to continue to stand? And if you're not able to stand through criticism, it's because you never really had the true conviction or commitment. Criticism is usually manifested, and you're not going to like this, because of jealousy, insecurity, or fear. They're jealous because you're making a stand and they can't. They're insecure because you're rattling their belief system. Or they're in fear because you might just persuade them. If you do not want to be criticized, here's what you do. Nothing. How many are going to go to sleep, <clears throat> maybe get up tomorrow and go to work, or get up on Monday and work? Well, then you should stay home because you're going to be criticized. I love my wife. She's so precious. Oh, that's no oh my. That's no oh my. But, <clears throat> you know, 
she has things that she does, and I have things that I do, and she wears things that she wears, and I wear things that I wear, and I don't usually say anything to her, but I think we've talked enough. We can talk, and if, you know, maybe she won't hear me. <laughs> but she likes certain shoes I don't like, and she'll say, do you, uh, how are these shoes? And I'm like, do you want to wear them? I particularly don't like them, but it's okay. And I always know if I'm dressing like for, for uh, church or whatever, if I come into the bedroom and she'll say, oh, that looks nice on you. And I'm like, okay. If I come into the bedroom, she goes, nothing. <laughs> I already know. But we're strong enough to know that it's okay. Right? I don't walk by her and spit on her shoes. I don't, <clears throat> I don't walk 10 feet in front of her because she had the, I don't throw things on her feet so that no one sees those ridiculous, horrible shoes. Now everyone's going to look at her shoes, <laughs> which is going to make me laugh so much today. I know that probably some of you look at my clothes and say, what in the world is he wearing? It don't really matter to me. I wear this in Walmart. And the more stairs I get, the more owls I go down. <laughs> and I try to walk fast so it flows. <laughs> or drop it and walk so it looks like I'm floating. I don't care. I get that from my father because my father could go out and do whatever. My mother, you know, my mother would say, you are not going out that way. He didn't care. Torn shirt, hair this way, didn't matter. He would say, who am I impressing? You have to learn to overcome criticism, right? It is better to be criticized for action than to be ignored for non-action. I like it because for the next couple of weeks, you're going to remember this and look at Gail's shoes every single <laughs> service. And that gives me a chuckle. <laughs> Even people on the Internet, they're going to get close to their TVs. What shoes does she have on? You will do all that you can not to look at her shoes today. You will do all that you can. Criticism is the leader's greatest test, are you ready, of maturity, conviction, and commitment to your vision. If this is your vision, then people are going to criticize you with it. And you have to be able to be mature, convicted, and committed. If not, criticism will cause you to be paralyzed. You won't be able to move. Three greatest lessons we need to learn in leadership. <clears throat> Personal sacrifice. Rejection. Criticism. You all thought I was having a brain fade. You had to help me, didn't you? You're like, it's too long. Criticism. Look at Matthew chapter 5, 11 and 12. Look at what it says. And I'll finish with this. How blessed you are when people insult you. I am so blessed. I cannot even contain my blessing. How blessed you are when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of vicious lies about you because you follow me. I am so blessed. Just this week, someone said, someone said, you said that. And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And they're hurt by it. I said, I don't know why they're hurt by anything I said because I didn't say anything. It's just part of life. How blessed you are when people what? Insult you. Now, don't go looking for it. Don't feel like you want to be blessed today and go look for an insult. But how blessed you are when people insult you, when they persecute you, and they tell all kinds of vicious lies about you because you follow me. And then what did he say in verse 12? And <laughs> You don't believe it. <clears throat> I said, what does it say in verse 12? What are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? You know, rejoice means you get up and spin around. When's the last time someone insulted you and you get up and spun around? Someone said, hey, they said this about you, and that's a lie. Let me <laughs> rejoice and be what? <clears throat> Glad because your reward. Where is it? 
heaven? I'm 30 years old. I don't plan to die on 90. I have to wait 60 years for my reward? We want a reward win. We want God to rush in, angels to come sing. Oh. We want God to do some happy things. We want uh, <clears throat> breezes of the Holy Ghost to come on us. We, we, when is your reward? In heaven. And then he says, they persecute the prophets before you in the same way. We want instant gratification. And God wants you to know he's looking for consistency. Because it's easy to be gratified for one moment, but not really have that conviction. You have to be people who are willing to be insulted. Someone say amen. amen. Who are willing to be persecuted. Someone say amen. amen. And not only be lied about, but have vicious lies told on you. And then what are you to do? Rejoice. When's the last time you rejoiced? Because someone was telling vicious lies about you. We want people to comfort us. Do you know what Beth said about me? And I want Nell to come and say, what did she say about you? And then I'm going to share to Nell what she said about me. And what I want Nell to say is this. She's horrible. And I'm going to say, you are right. But what if she said something bad about me? And I said, Nell, Beth said something horrible about me. And she said, well, let's rejoice. Let's sing. Hit the music. Let's dance. I wouldn't go to Nell anymore. <laughs> Unless I understood the truth of the word. Amen? Be a leader. Be the leader that God wants you to be. It's not going to be easy, but it will be worth it because you're getting a reward. When? In heaven. Your reward now is you're rejoicing and you're dancing. Hallelujah. Let's stand before Jehovah. He's so good to us. Amen. Let's stand. Children, come on. We're going to pray over you. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you and praise you for each child that's represented underneath this prayer show. We ask God whether they are Rachel or Rebecca, or Leah, <coughs> or Sarah, or whether they are Ephraim or Manasseh or Joseph or Peter or Paul or an Esther or Mary. Father, Lord, you will use them for your kingdom and for your glory. Let them rise to be great leaders for their generation. Father, willing to take the personal sacrifice, willing, Father, Lord, to even experience rejection and even willing to take on the criticism, Father, Lord, as they are been appointed unto you to lead a generation into the promised land, to understanding who you are and what you are. I ask that your spirit fall fresh on them, continue to use them in mighty ways, guard them against the enemy and the snares of the fowler, and we'll give you praise in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Lift up your hands to receive the priestly blessing. This morning, give our Thank you. 
Yehovah, he who exists, you know, before you're presenting gifts, and will guard you with a hedge of protection. And Yehovah, he who exists, will eliminate the wholeness of his being towards you, bring in order. He will provide you with love, sustenance, and friendship. And Yehovah, he who exists, will lift up wholeness of his being, look upon you. He will set in place all you need to be whole and complete. May Yehovah grant all the desires of our hearts, fulfill all our purposes and all our petitions. May Yehovah hear from heaven, quickly answer all our requests. Save us in the day of adversity. And in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, defend us from our enemies, from poverty and from bondage. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.